Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I'm Chris Weber, the pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I pray that this video finds you well as we continue to celebrate the wonderful gift that is Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you haven't already done so, please find a seat, stop whatever it is you're doing, and I invite you to take a nice deep breath with me as we remember again the identity bestowed upon us as God's children, as a gift of grace. We are those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as has been handed down to us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. reading from Acts chapter 4. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Here ends the reading. To all of you children out there listening today, 
The story that we heard is from a book called Acts, and it takes place a little bit after Jesus has risen from the dead. And in that story, we get a glimpse into what being part of the people of God was like. And it's pretty amazing. People cared about each other so much that they were willing to sell their possessions, to sell their houses, their land, in order to support and care for one another. Today, it would be like us selling our houses or our land or our cars or our toys or whatever we might have because we see another Christian is in need and we want to help them out. This is how the people of God lived. And it wasn't just because they wanted to be nice. It's because God had loved them so much that he had given his son on the cross, that he had forgiven their sins, that he had given them the promise of eternal life. And out of that incredible gift, right, that they get to live forever with Christ, out of that wonderful gift, they wanted to share blessings and generosity of love with other people around them. We get a glimpse into what the church looked like then. And as we look at the church today, as we look at God's people today, we continue to see those acts of love, and those acts of generosity. And it is so wonderful to be a part of that. When people make phone calls, when they uh, have a nice conversation and, and, and care about somebody else that's in need, when they share their things together, even when you share your things with somebody else, that is a way that we share God's love with others because of the wonderful gift of Christ. Now, for the rest of you out there listening today, it's been wonderful to be a part of this congregation for the last two years, and I look forward to the days and the years ahead with all of you. This is a very generous and wonderfully caring congregation, and I want to take some time to reflect upon that generosity today, and especially where that generosity comes from. Now, personally speaking, I've experienced the generosity of this congregation towards me and my wife and my kids being extremely cared for and welcomed since we got here. And honestly, even prior during the call process, just to see the, the generosity of this congregation. But I want to move beyond just my own personal experience of that and reflect upon the larger generosity of the people here. You see, it's pretty amazing when I call up somebody who is struggling or in need in some way in our congregation. It is pretty amazing that many times when I do so, I find out that I'm not the per first person to call them. Other people in the congregation have been in contact with them and love and care. That is such a wonderful thing that this body of Christ is moving towards each other in that way. It is a joy to continue to hear about um, birthday cards and anniversary cards that go out at times or gifts that are purchased to celebrate different events in people's lives or meals that are shared with each other. I continue to be incredibly humbled when I hear of some of you and, and how deep your life of prayer is. That if you wake up in the middle of the night, you spend time praying for the people of this congregation or you have a pattern in the morning or the afternoon that you every day are praying for people in our congregation. That is an act of generosity, of an overflow of ourselves towards others. And our generosity as a congregation is also seen with the use of our little pantry, with the sock drive for the homeless that we've done in the past. And even more recently this year with the pandemic, even though it hasn't been fun and it hasn't been easy, it is an act of generosity to withhold in-person services at times, even though we don't necessarily like it, or to maintain six feet or to wear masks because we desire the generous abundance of well-being and life for each other and for the surrounding community. Now, as I was reflecting upon this congregation, I was also reminded that this generosity doesn't begin with us because we see it in other places as well. In fact, I imagine many of you have seen and experienced other congregations and their love and care as well. I've been part of other churches where people purchase things for one another's houses, where people call each other up when there is job loss or grief, or other people get to the hospital to see somebody who is sick before the pastor ever does first. This generosity, it doesn't begin with us. We see it in other congregations around us. 
And it's even bigger than that because it's not just about today, it actually goes back into our past as well. Martin Luther, our famous monk turned reformer, married a woman named Katharina von Bora. Uh, she was a nun and they got married in June of 1520. Being a monk and a nun, they didn't have any money when they got married. Luther never took any money for the massive amount of books that he wrote. And so the elector gave them the Augustinian cloister as a home for them. Cloister being a place where they, uh, many of the monks would live. Uh, but because that was closed down, they gave that building to Luther and Katerina as a home. Very large space. Now, after their wedding, on the day of their wedding, after the wedding was done and all the guests went home, they had an unexpected guest show up at their door, a man named Karlstadt. Karlstadt had been kicked out of Saxony and had kind of a mixed past with Luther. But Luther and Katerina took Karlstadt in. This newlywed couple, right, on the night of their marriage, took somebody into their home, and not just that night, but for a number of weeks. In fact, this pattern of hospitality continued after Karlstadt left. Um, yes, Luther and Katerina had their own six children that they took care of. They also uh, took care of four orphans. They housed people that were coming in to study at the university. At the most, they would have up to 25 people living in that house with them. And from what I can tell, they didn't charge anybody anything. Out of their own resources, Katerina would cook meals for everybody. Right? This is incredible generosity, radical hospitality. And it's so incredible to reflect upon that we are part of this, right? This larger heritage of generosity together. But it's bigger than that. It, it goes back, it's not just a Lutheran thing, right? And it goes back even prior to Luther and his wife as well. If we look back in the early church at certain places and times in the ancient world, there was a uh, awful reality uh, that people could abandon their children. Uh, in certain parts of the world, this was culturally acceptable, that they could just leave their child somewhere if they didn't want them, especially at a very young age. But what's amazing is that frequently the Christian church in those areas where this would happen would often take these children and raise them as their own. Right? That is an act of generosity. It is a huge inconvenience, but it is a desire to out of their own resources, out of their own life, to offer life to somebody else, to take them in as part of their own family. And there's plenty of stories in the early church about hospitality of having Christians in their homes that are traveling through areas or, or offering food or resources or clothing or whatever it is that may be needed. But it goes back even prior to this as well. And we see that in the story in Acts today. We see the apostles and the church living in a way of generosity. <coughs> Excuse me. The writer of the book of Acts uh, says that there wasn't a needy person amongst that group, which is remarkable, right? They were sort of removing poverty from amongst them, and they did so through generosity. People were selling homes, people were selling property, and we have to remember that land, again, was a, a means to a way of living, right? You'd farm the land, you create money and resources from the land. People were selling their land and bringing the money to the apostles to be distributed so that those that didn't have could have and would be cared for, as if they were all equals together. Barnabas, uh, a man who would later on travel with Paul, is one of those who sold a field and brought the proceeds to the apostles. This is incredible hospitality, right? We can trace it back from ourselves, back to Luther and Katerina, back to the early church, and even back to the apostles as well, right? We are part of a much larger connection of people who live a life of generosity. But if we stop our history of generosity with our congregation for some reason, or even if we confine it to being like a Lutheran thing, or even if we go back and we stop our history of generosity with the apostles, we lose sight of the very source of this generosity that we live in today. The resurrection of Jesus is the event that reshapes the entire community of God's people. It reshapes the lives of the apostles, of the church after them, 
all the way to us today. You see, God's desire for well-being for people, for humanity, his desire for creation to flourish is on display in the resurrection of Jesus, right? We see this in Christ, and it's incredible. We see this desire on display in Jesus, and it reshapes us, right? This is what the people of God have been trusting in. The people of God are those that throughout history have been trusting in the gift of Jesus Christ. When we think about the resurrection, it is an act of God's generosity. Humanity, you and I and all of humanity, were impoverished because of death, right? The only thing that remained on our horizon was death. But because of Christ, he has brought an overflow of life into the world. He has brought an abundance of eternal life, right? Resurrection of the body and care for the body for eternity. This is an incredible act of generosity that flows out of God himself. And we see that generosity and that desire for well-being for people flowing from the empty tomb out to the women at the empty tomb, to the apostles to the church in their day, all the way down to us today. We are all rooted together in this resurrection of Christ. And it reshapes us, right? That generosity that we show today is a participation in and an extension of the very generous gift of the life of Christ himself. Now, sometimes when we consider examples of generosity, whether it's the story of Acts and the amazing reality that people were selling their property to help alleviate the needs within their own groups, or when we hear stories of Luther and Katerina opening their home and taking care of people, or we hear stories of other congregations and Christians today doing things that are sort of remarkably generous Sometimes when we hear those stories, we start to compare ourselves. But the acts of generosity in our unique situation as a congregation or as individuals, no matter how big they may seem or significant or how seemingly small or unnoticed they are, every single one of them matters. Every single act of generosity, no matter how great or small, how seen or unseen it is, matters because it flows out of the generosity of Christ himself. It is a work of the Holy Spirit today, bringing the gift of Christ's life into this world, a world in which the victory of Jesus' life will have the final say. We see God's generosity in Jesus giving life into the world, and that gift has flown all the as, as flown, excuse me, flowed out of the uh, out of the empty tomb through the apostles all the way to us today, and we get to continue to be again a participation and an extension of that great generous gift with the very lives that we live. This is wonderful. It means we are deeply connected with all of the church today around the world and throughout history. We all share in this same foundation of the resurrection. And no matter what it is we are doing as far as our lives of generosity and love goes, all of it matters. Whether that's our little food pantry or our sock drive, whether it's a, a phone call, a card or a gift, whether it's welcoming the Concordia St. Paul Choir as we did back in Lent, whether it's the things we do during this pandemic, whatever it is, all of it matters, and all of it will continue on in some capacity as a generous outpouring of the resurrection of Christ in our lives. It is such a joy to be a part of this congregation, and it is a joy to be part of the larger church because it is a joy to be connected to Christ who reigns today and is bringing his conquering of death into the world for us. Our acts of generosity may change, and we may not do the same things that we've done in the past. We may do new things or old things, but all of it flows out of that resurrection promise, out of the desire of God for well-being for humanity. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the generous gift of Christ, for his death on the cross, and for his resurrection, 
and the outpouring of the abundance of life that is enough to fill up death and bring life again. Continue to keep us connected with this generous outpouring by the power of the Spirit connected with Christ who has both died and risen, that we would be considered dead to our sins, but alive in Jesus Christ today. And remind us again and again of this wonderful connection that we share with the church throughout um, the world today and throughout history as well, that all of our acts of generosity flow out of the wonderful same source together, and therefore all matter together. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we do pray for uh, the abundance of life to be poured out in the world today, especially in the midst of sickness and the ongoing pandemic. There are growing concerns around variants in our state, uh, in our country, and in other parts of the world still as well. Uh, but also, the, uh, we, we are thankful for the scientific advancements of vaccines and their distribution as well. Uh, we pray for protection of people that lives would continue to be spared, uh, even as we know many are getting sick and many are still dying. Bring the hope of the resurrection into this situation. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for uh, the Twin Cities still, um, for the reality of, of racism that has been at work in our country for a very long time, even though it has changed and, and, and taken on different forms over the years. We do pray for the tensions around the court case currently. We lift up to you, again, Derek Chauvin. We lift up to you the family of George Floyd, the jurors in the midst of hearing the case and all those involved with the case as well. Uh, we pray for justice in the decision that is made. We pray for the police working these days um, in this tense time, and we pray for all the protesters who desire uh, for the protesters and their voice to be heard as well. We pray for our communities, for divisions to be put away, for hatred and even systemic uh, racism to be acknowledged and to be worked against in various ways. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you uh, many places in the world that are suffering still from disasters. Uh, we, um, whether they're natural disasters or whether they are humanitarian disasters inflicted by others, we lift up to you the people of Myanmar, uh, the people of Xinjiang, and the people uh, affected by the recent volcanic eruption that has uh, been taking place, and for others who are upon our hearts and minds today. Lord, in your mercy, trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray as you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Again, I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today, and that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace as his baptized children who are living in the life of Christ, who has been raised from the dead. Until we have the opportunity to see each other again, I pray that you continue to stay connected together because we are all bound together by the Spirit in this gift of resurrection, joined together as one body in our one Lord by this one Spirit. Continue to make good and wise decisions about where you go, the places you go, the people you see, the conversations you have, that we may be uh, putting forward the life of love that Christ desires us to together. And until we have the opportunity to see each other again, I pray you have a blessed week.